At twenty past six, Vera felt that to sit there longer was unbearable. She would go to her room and bathe her aching head and temples in cold water. She got up and went towards the door. Then she remembered and came back and got a candle out of the box. She lighted it, let a little wax pour into a saucer, and stuck the candle firmly to it. Then she went out of the room, shutting the door behind her and leaving the four men inside. She went up the stairs and along the passage to her room. As she opened her door, she suddenly halted and stood stock still. Her nostrils quivered. The sea! The smell of the sea at St. Trednick! And that was it. She could not be mistaken. Of course, one smelt the sea on an island anyway, but this was different. It was the smell there had been on the beach that day, with the tide out, and the rocks covered with seaweed drying in the sun. Can I swim out to the island, Miss Claythorne? Why can't I swim out to the island? Horrid, whiny, spoilt little brat. If it weren't for him, Hugo would be rich, able to marry the girl he loved. Hugo. Surely. Surely Hugo is beside her. No. Waiting for her in the room. She made a step forward. The draught from the window caught the flame of the candle. It flickered and went out. In the dark she was suddenly afraid. Don't be a fool, Vera Claythorne urged herself. It's all right. The others are downstairs, all four of them. There's no one in the room. There can't be. You're imagining things, my girl. But that smell, that smell of the beach at St. Trednick, that wasn't imagined. It was true. And there was someone in the room. She had heard something. Surely she had heard something. And then, as she stood there, listening... A cold, clammy hand touched her throat, a wet hand, smelling of the sea. Vera screamed. She screamed and screamed, screams of the utmost terror, wild, desperate cries for help. She did not hear the sounds from below, of a chair being overturned, of a door opening, of men's feet running up the stairs. She was conscious only of supreme terror. Then, restoring her sanity, lights flickered in the doorway, candles, men hurrying into the room. What the devil? What's happened? Good God! What was it? She shuddered, took a step forward, collapsed on the floor. She was only half aware of someone bending over her, of someone forcing her head down between her knees. Then a sudden exclamation, a quick, My God! Look at that! Her senses returned. She opened her eyes and raised her head. She saw what it was the men with the candles were looking at. A broad ribbon of wet seaweed was hanging down from the ceiling. It was that which in the darkness had swayed against her throat. It was that which she had taken for a clammy hand, a drowned hand come back from the dead to squeeze the life out of her. She began to laugh hysterically. She said, <laughs> It was seaweed! <laughs> Only seaweed! And that's what the smell was! And then the faintness came over her once more, waves upon waves of sickness. Again someone took her head and forced it between her knees. Aeons of time seemed to pass. They were offering her something to drink, pressing the glass against her lips. She smelt brandy. She was just about to gulp the spirit gratefully down when suddenly a warning note, like an alarm bell, sounded in her brain. She sat up, pushing the glass away. She said sharply, Where did this come from? Law's voice answered. He stared a minute before speaking. He said, oh, I got it from downstairs. Vera cried, I won't drink it. There was a moment's silence. Then Lombard laughed. He said with appreciation, <laughs> Good for you, Vera. You've got your wits about you, even if you have been scared half out of your life. I'll get a fresh bottle that hasn't been opened. He went swiftly out. Vera said uncertainly, I'm all right now. I'll have some water. Armstrong supported her as she struggled to her feet. She went over to the basin, swaying, and clutched at him for support. She let the cold tap run, then filled the glass. Bloor said resentfully, But that brandy's all right. Armstrong said, How do you know? Bloor said angrily, I didn't put anything in it. That's what you're getting at, I suppose. Armstrong said, I'm not saying you did. You might have done it, or someone might have tampered with the bottle for just this emergency. Lombard came swiftly back into the room. He had a new bottle of brandy in his hands and a corkscrew. He thrust the sealed bottle under Vera's nose. 
There you are, my girl. Absolutely no deception. He peeled off the tinfoil and drew the cork. Lucky there's a good supply of spirits in the house. Thoughtful of you, Anne Owen. Vera shuddered violently. Armstrong held the glass while Philip poured the brandy into it. He said, You'd better drink this, Miss Claythorn. You've had a nasty shock. Vera drank a little of the spirit. The colour came back to her face. Philip Lombard said with a laugh, Well, here's one murder that hasn't gone according to plan. Vera said almost in a whisper, You think that was what was meant? Lombard nodded. Expected you to pass out through fright. Some people would have, wouldn't they, Doctor? Armstrong did not commit himself. He said doubtfully, Hmm, impossible to say. Young, healthy subject. No cardiac weakness. Unlikely. But on the other hand, he picked up the glass of brandy that Bloor had brought. He dipped a finger in it, tasted it gingerly. His expression did not alter. He said dubiously, Hmm, tastes all right. Bloor stepped forward angrily. He said, If you're saying that I tampered with that, I'll knock your ruddy block off. Vera, her wits revived by the brandy, made a diversion by saying, Where's the judge? The three men looked at each other. Well, that's odd. Thought he came up with us. Bloor said, So did I. What about it, doctor? You came up the stairs behind me. Armstrong said, I thought he was following me. Of course, he'd be bound to go slower than we did. He's an old man. They looked at each other again. Lombard said, It's damned odd. Law cried, We must look for him. He started for the door. The others followed him. Vera last. As they went down the stairs, Armstrong said over his shoulder, Of course, he may have stayed in the living room. They crossed the hall. Armstrong called out loudly, Wargrave? Wargrave, where are you? There was no answer. A deadly silence filled the house, apart from the gentle patter of the rain. Then, in the entrance to the drawing-room door, Armstrong stopped dead. The others crowded up and looked over his shoulder. Somebody cried out. Mr. Justice Wargrave was sitting in his high-backed chair at the end of the room. Two candles burnt on either side of him. But what shocked and startled the onlookers was the fact that he sat there robed in scarlet, with a judge's wig upon his head. Dr. Armstrong motioned to the others to keep back. He himself walked across to the silent, staring figure, reeling a little as he walked like a drunken man. He bent forward, peering into the still face. Then, with a swift movement, he raised the wig. It fell to the floor, revealing the high, bald forehead, with, in the very middle, a round, stained mark, from which something had trickled. Dr. Armstrong raised the limp hand and felt for the pulse. Then he turned to the others. He said, and his voice was expressionless, dead, far away, He's been shot. Bloor said, God, the revolver! The doctor said, still in the same lifeless voice, Got him through the head. Instantaneous. Vera stooped to the wig. She said, and her voice shook with terror, Miss Brent's missing grey wool. Bloor said, And the scarlet curtain that was missing from the bathroom. Vera whispered, So, this is what they wanted them for. Suddenly, Philip Lombard laughed, a high, unnatural laugh. Five little Indian boys going in for law. One got in chancery, and then there were four. That's the end of Mr. Bloody Justice Wargrave. No more pronouncing sentence for him. No more putting on of the black cap. Here's the last time he'll ever sit in court. No more summing up and sending innocent men to death. How Edward Seaton would laugh if he were here. God! How he'd laugh! His outburst shocked and startled the others. Vera cried, Only this morning you said he was the one! Philip Lombard's face changed, sobered. He said in a low voice, I know I did. Well, I was wrong. 
Here's one more of us who's been proved innocent. Too late. Chapter 14 They had carried Mr. Justice Wargrave up to his room and laid him on the bed. Then they had come down again and had stood in the hall looking at each other. Bloor said heavily, well, What do we do now? Lombard said briskly, Have something to eat. We've got to eat, you know. Once again they went into the kitchen. Again they opened a tin of tongue. They ate mechanically, almost without tasting. Vera said, I shall never eat tongue again. They finished the meal. They sat round the kitchen table, staring at each other. Bloor said, Only four of us now. Who'll be next? Armstrong stared. He said almost mechanically, We must be very careful, and stopped. Bloor nodded. And that's what he said. And now he's dead. Armstrong said, how did it happen, I wonder? Lombard swore. He said, A damned clever double-cross. That stuff was planted in Miss Claythorne's room, and it worked just as it was intended to. Everyone dashes up there, thinking she's being murdered, and so, in the confusion, someone caught the old boy off his guard. Bloor said, well, Why didn't anyone hear the shot? Lombard shook his head. Miss Claythorne was screaming. The wind was howling. We were running about and calling out. No, it wouldn't be heard. He paused. But that trick's not going to work again. You'll have to try something else next time. Bloor said, He probably will. There was an unpleasant tone in his voice. The two men eyed each other. Armstrong said, Four of us. And we don't know which. Bloor said, I know. Vera said, I haven't the least doubt. Armstrong said slowly, I suppose I do know, really. Philip Lombard said, I think I've got a pretty good idea now. Again they all looked at each other. Vera staggered to her feet. She said, I feel awful. I must go to bed. I'm dead beat. Lombard said, Might as well. No good sitting watching each other. Bloor said, I've no objection. The doctor murmured, The best thing to do. Although I doubt if any of us will sleep. They moved to the door. Bloor said, I wonder where that revolver is now. They went up the stairs. The next move was a little like a scene in a farce. Each one of the four stood with a hand on his or her bedroom door handle. Then, as though at a signal, each one stepped into the room and pulled the door shut. There were sounds of bolts and locks, of the moving of furniture. Four frightened people were barricaded in until morning. Philip Lombard drew a breath of relief as he turned from adjusting a chair under the door handle. He strolled across to the dressing table. By the light of the flickering candle, he studied his face curiously. He said softly to himself, Yes. This business has got you rattled all right. His sudden wolf-like smile flashed out. He undressed quickly. He went over to the bed, placing his wristwatch on the table by the bed. Then he opened the drawer of the table. He stood there, staring down at the revolver that was inside it. Vera Claythorne lay in bed. The candle still burned beside her. As yet, she could not summon the courage to put it out. She was afraid of the dark. She told herself again and again, You're all right until morning. Nothing happened last night. Nothing will happen tonight. Nothing can happen. You're locked and bolted in. No one can come near you. And she thought suddenly, Of course. I can stay here. Stay here, locked in. Food doesn't really matter. I can stay here, safely, till help comes even if it's a day or two days. Stay here. Yes. But could she stay here? Hour after hour, with no one to speak to, with nothing to do but think. She'd begin to think of Cornwall, of Hugo, of... of what she'd said to Cyril, 
horrid, whiny little boy always pestering her. Miss Claythorne, why can't I swim out to the rock? I can, I know I can. Was it her voice that had answered? Of course you can, Cyril. Really, I know that. Can I go then, Miss Claythorne? Well, you see, Cyril, your mother gets so nervous about you. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow you can swim out to the rock. I'll talk to your mother on the beach and distract her attention, and then when she looks for you, there you'll be, standing on the rock, waving to her. It will be a surprise. Oh, good egg, Miss Claythorne, that will be a lark. She'd said it now. Tomorrow. Hugo was going to Newquay. When he came back, it would be all over. Yes. But supposing it wasn't. Supposing it went wrong. Cyril might be rescued in time, and then, then he'd say, Miss Claythorne said I could. Well, what of it? One must take some risk. If the worst happened, she'd brazen it out. How can you tell such a wicked lie, Cyril? Of course I never said any such thing. They'd believe her, all right. Cyril often told stories. He was an untruthful child. Cyril would know, of course. But that didn't matter. And anyway, nothing would go wrong. She'd pretend to swim out after him, but she'd arrive too late. Nobody would ever suspect. Had Hugo suspected? Was that why he had looked at her in that queer, far-off way? Had Hugo known? Was that why he had gone off after the inquest so hurriedly? He hadn't answered the one letter she'd written to him. Hugo. Vera turned restlessly in bed. No, no, she mustn't think of Hugo. It hurt too much. That was all over, over and done with. Hugo must be forgotten. Why, this evening, had she suddenly felt that Hugo was in the room with her? She stared up at the ceiling, stared at the big black hook in the middle of the room. She'd never noticed that hook before. The seaweed had hung from that. She shivered as she remembered that cold, clammy touch on her neck. She didn't like that hook on the ceiling. It drew your eyes, fascinated you. A big, black hook. Ex-Inspector Bloor sat on the side of his bed. His small eyes, red-rimmed and bloodshot, were alert in the solid mass of his face. He was like a wild boar waiting to charge. He felt no inclination to sleep. The menace was coming very near now. Six out of ten... For all his sagacity, for all his caution and astuteness, the old judge had gone the way of the rest. Bloor snorted with a kind of savage satisfaction. <laughs> what was it the old geezer had said? We must be very careful. Self-righteous, smug old hypocrite. Sitting up in court feeling like God Almighty. He'd got his all right. No more being careful for him. And now there were four of them. The girl, Lombard... Armstrong and himself. Very soon, another of them would go. But it wouldn't be William Henry Bloor. He'd see to that all right. But the revolver. What about the revolver? That was the disturbing factor. The revolver. Bloor sat on his bed. His brow furrowed, his little eyes creased and puckered while he pondered the problem of the revolver. In the silence, he could hear the clock strike downstairs. Midnight. He relaxed a little now, even went so far as to lie down on his bed, but he did not undress. He lay there thinking, going over the whole business from the beginning, methodically, painstakingly, as he had been wont to do in his police officer days. It was thoroughness that paid in the end. The candle was burning down. Looking to see if the matches were within easy reach of his hand, he blew it out. Strangely enough, he found the darkness disquieting. It was as though a thousand age-old fears awoke and struggled for supremacy in his brain. Faces floated in the air. The judge's face, crowned with that mockery of grey wool. The cold, dead face of Mrs. Rogers. The convulsed purple face of Antony Marston. Another face, pale, spectacled with a small, straw-coloured moustache. A face he had seen some time or other, but when? Not on the island. No. Much longer ago than that. Funny that he couldn't put a name to it. Silly sort of face, really. The fellow looked a bit of a mug. Of course. It came to him with a real shock. Landor. 
Odd to think he'd completely forgotten what Landor looked like. Only yesterday he'd been trying to recall the fellow's face and hadn't been able to. And now here it was, every feature clear and distinct, as though he had seen it only yesterday. Landor had had a wife, a thin slip of a woman with a worried face. There'd been a kid, too, a girl about fourteen. For the first time he wondered what had become of them. The revolver. What had become of the revolver? That was much more important. The more he thought about it, the more puzzled he was. He didn't understand this revolver business. Somebody in the house had got that revolver. Downstairs a clock struck one. Bloor's thoughts were cut short. He sat up on the bed, suddenly alert, for he had heard a sound, a very faint sound, somewhere outside his bedroom door. There was someone moving about in the darkened house. The perspiration broke out on his forehead. Who was it? Moving secretly and silently along the corridors. Someone who was up to no good. He'd bet that. Noiselessly, in spite of his heavy build, he dropped off the bed and with two strides was standing by the door listening. But the sound did not come again. Nevertheless, Bloor was convinced that he was not mistaken. He had heard a footfall just outside his door. The hair rose slightly on his scalp. He knew fear again. Someone creeping about stealthily in the night. He listened. But the sound was not repeated. And now... A new temptation assailed him. He wanted, desperately, to go out and investigate, if he could only see who it was prowling about in the darkness. But to open his door would be the action of a fool. Very likely that was exactly what the other was waiting for. He might even have meant Bloor to hear what he had heard, counting on him coming out to investigate. Bloor stood rigid, listening. He could hear sounds everywhere now. Cracks, rustles, mysterious whispers but his dogged, realistic brain knew them for what they were, the creations of his own heated imagination. And then, suddenly, he heard something that was not imagination. Footsteps, very soft, very cautious, but plainly audible to a man listening with all his ears as Bloor was listening. They came softly along the corridor. Both Lombard's and Armstrong's rooms were farther from the stairhead than his, they passed his door without hesitating or faltering. And as they did so, Bloor made up his mind. He meant to see who it was. The footsteps had definitely passed his door going to the stairs. Where was the man going? When Bloor acted, he acted quickly, surprisingly so for a man who looked so heavy and slow. He tiptoed back to the bed, slipped matches into his pocket, detached the plug of the electric lamp by his bed, and picked it up, winding the flex round it. It was a chromium affair, with a heavy ebonite base, a useful weapon. He sprinted noiselessly across the room, removed the chair from under the door handle, and with precaution unlocked and unbolted the door. He stepped out into the corridor. There was a faint sound in the hall below. Bloor ran noiselessly in his stockinged feet to the head of the stairs. At that moment, he realized why it was he had heard all these sounds so clearly. The wind had died down completely, and the sky must have cleared. There was a faint moonlight coming in through the landing window, and it illuminated the hall below. Bloor had an instantaneous glimpse of a figure just passing out through the front door. In the act of running down the stairs in pursuit, he paused. Once again, he had nearly made a fool of himself. This was a trap, perhaps to lure him out of the house. But what the other man didn't realize was that he had made a mistake, had delivered himself neatly into Bloor's hands, for of the three tenanted rooms upstairs, one must now be empty. All that had to be done was to ascertain which. Bloor went swiftly back along the corridor. He paused first at Dr. Armstrong's door and tapped. There was no answer. He waited a minute then went on to Philip Lombard's room. Here the answer came at once. Who's there? It's Bloor. I don't think Armstrong is in his room. Wait a minute. He went on to the door at the end of the corridor. Here he tapped again. A Miss Claythorne? Miss Claythorne? Vera's voice, startled, answered him. Who is it? What's the matter? It's all right, Miss Claythorne. Wait a minute. 
I'll come back. He raced back to Lombard's room. The door opened as he did so. Lombard stood there. He held a candle in his left hand. He had pulled on his trousers over his pyjamas. His right hand rested in the pocket of his pyjama jacket. He said sharply, What the hell's all this? Bloor explained rapidly. Lombard's eyes lit up. Armstrong, eh? So he's our pigeon. He moved along to Armstrong's door. Sorry, Bloor, but I don't take anything on trust. He rapped sharply on the panel. Armstrong? Armstrong? There was no answer. Lombard dropped to his knees and peered through the keyhole. He inserted his little finger gingerly into the lock. He said, Key's not in the door on the inside. Bloor said, Well, that means he locked it on the outside and took it with him. Philip nodded. Ordinary precaution to take. We'll get him, Bloor. This time we'll get him. Half a second. He raced along to Vera's room. Vera? Yes? We're hunting Armstrong. He's out of his room. Whatever you do, don't open your door. Understand? Yes, I understand. If Armstrong comes along and says that I've been killed or Bloor's been killed, pay no attention, see? Only open your door if both Bloor and I speak to you. Got that? Vera said. Yes, I'm not a complete fool. Lombard said. Good. He joined Bloor. He said. And now, after him. The hunt's up. Bloor said. We'd better be careful. He's got a revolver, remember? Philip Lombard raced down the stairs, chuckling. He said, <laughs> That's where you're wrong. He undid the front door, remarking, Latch pushed back so that he could get in again easily. He went on, I've got that revolver. He took it half out of his pocket as he spoke. Found it put back in my drawer tonight. Bloor stopped dead on the doorstep. His face changed. Philip Lombard saw it. He said impatiently, Don't be a damn fool, Bloor. I'm not going to shoot you. Go back and barricade yourself in, if you like. I'm off after Armstrong. He started off into the moonlight. Bloor, after a minute's hesitation, followed him. He thought to himself, I suppose I'm asking for it, but after all... After all, he had tackled criminals armed with revolvers before now. Whatever else he lacked, Bloor did not lack courage. Show him the danger, and he would tackle it pluckily. He was not afraid of danger in the open only of danger undefined and tinged with the supernatural. Vera, left to wait results, got up and dressed. She glanced over once or twice at the door. It was a good, solid door. It was both bolted and locked, and had an oak chair wedged under the handle. It could not be broken open by force, certainly not by Dr. Armstrong. He was not a physically powerful man. If she were Armstrong, intent on murder, it was cunning that she would employ, not force. She amused herself by reflecting on the means he might employ. He might, as Philip had suggested, announce that one of the other two men was dead. Or he might possibly pretend to be mortally wounded himself, might drag himself groaning to her door. There were other possibilities. He might inform her that the house was on fire. More... He might actually set the house on fire. Yes, that would be a possibility. Lure the other two men out of the house, then, having previously laid a trail of petrol, he might set light to it. And she, like an idiot, would remain barricaded in her room until it was too late. She crossed over to the window. Well, not too bad. At a pinch one could escape that way. It would mean a drop, but there was a handy flower bed. She sat down and, picking up her diary, began to write in it, in a clear, flowing hand. One must pass the time. Suddenly, she stiffened to attention. She had heard a sound. It was, she thought, a sound like breaking glass. And it came from somewhere downstairs. She listened hard. But the sound was not repeated. She heard, or thought she heard, stealthy sounds of footsteps the creak of stairs, the rustle of garments. But there was nothing definite, and she concluded, as Bloor had done earlier, that such sounds had their origin in her own imagination. But presently she heard sounds of a more concrete nature, people moving about downstairs, the murmur of voices, then the very decided sound of someone mounting the stairs, doors opening and shutting, feet going up to the attics overhead, more noises from there. Finally, the steps came along the passage. 
Lombard's voice said, Vera, are you all right? Yes, what happened? Bloor's voice said, Will you let us in? Vera went to the door. She removed the chair, unlocked the door, and slid back the bolt. She opened the door. The two men were breathing hard. Their feet and the bottom of their trousers were soaking wet. She said again, What's happened? Lombard said, Armstrong's disappeared. Vera cried, What? Lombard said, Vanished clean off the island. Bloor concurred. Vanished. That's the word, like some damn conjuring trick. Vera said impatiently, Nonsense. He's hiding somewhere. Bloor said, No, he isn't. I tell you, there's nowhere to hide on this island. It's as bare as your hand. There's moonlight outside, as clear as day it is, and he's not to be found. Vera said, He doubled back into the house. Bloor said, We thought of that. We've searched the house, too. You must have heard us. He's not here, I tell you. He's gone. Clean vanished. Vamoosed. Vera said incredulously, I don't believe it. Lombard said, It's true, my dear. He paused and then said, There's one other little fact. A pane in the dining room window has been smashed, and there are only three little Indian boys on the table. End of Disc 4 and then there were none. Disc 5 Chapter 15 Three people sat eating breakfast in the kitchen. Outside the sun shone. It was a lovely day. The storm was a thing of the past. And with the change in the weather, a change had come in the mood of the prisoners on the island. They felt now like people just awakening from a nightmare. There was danger yet, but it was danger in daylight, that paralyzing atmosphere of fear that had wrapped them round like a blanket yesterday while the wind howled outside was gone. Lombard said, We'll try heliographing today with a mirror from the highest point of the island. Some bright lad wandering on the cliff will recognize SOS when he sees it, I hope. In the evening we could try a bonfire. Only there isn't much wood, and anyway they might just think it was song and dance and merriment. Vera said, Surely someone can read Morse, and then they'll come and take us off, long before this evening. Lombard said, Well, the weather's cleared all right, but the sea hasn't gone down yet. Terrific swell on. They won't be able to get a boat near the island before tomorrow. Vera cried, Another night in this place. Lombard shrugged his shoulders. May as well face it. Twenty-four hours will do it, I think. If we can last out that, we'll be all right. Bloor cleared his throat. He said, We'd better come to a clear understanding. What's happened to Armstrong? Lombard said, Well, we've got one piece of evidence. Only three little Indian boys left on the dinner table. It looks as though Armstrong had got his quietus. Vera said, well, Then why haven't you found his dead body? Bloor said, Exactly. Lombard shook his head. He said, It's damned odd. No getting over it. Bloor said doubtfully, well, It might have been thrown into the sea. Lombard said sharply, well, By whom? You? Me? You saw him go out of the front door. You come along and find me in my room. We go out and search together. When the devil had I time to kill him and carry his body round the island? Bloor said, I don't know. But I do know one thing. Lombard said. What's that? Law said. Well, the revolver. It was your revolver. It's in your possession now. There's nothing to show that it hasn't been in your possession all along. Oh, come now, Blore, we were all searched. Yes, you'd hidden it away before that happened. Afterwards, you just took it back again. Ah, good blockhead. I swear to you that it was put back in my drawer. Greatest surprise I ever had in my life when I found it there. Law said, You ask us to believe a thing like that? <laughs> Why the devil should Armstrong, or anyone else for that matter, put it back? Lombard raised his shoulders hopelessly. I haven't the least idea. It's just crazy. The last thing one would expect. There seems no point in it. Law agreed. No, there isn't. You might have thought of a better story. Rather proof that I'm telling the truth, isn't it? Well, I don't look at it that way. Philip said, 
You wouldn't. Bloor said, Look here, Mr. Lombard. If you're an honest man, as you pretend, Philip murmured, When did I lay claims to being an honest man? No, indeed, I never said that. Bloor went on stolidly. If you're speaking the truth, there's only one thing to be done. As long as you have that revolver, Miss Claythorne and I are at your mercy. The only fair thing is to put that revolver with the other things that are locked up, and you and I will hold the two keys still. Philip Lombard lit a cigarette. As he puffed smoke, he said, Don't be an ass. Well, you won't agree to that? No, I won't. That revolver's mine. I need it to defend myself, and I'm going to keep it. Bloor said, In that case, we're bound to come to one conclusion. That I'm you, N. Owen? Think what you damn well please. But I'll ask you, if that's so, why I didn't pot you with a revolver last night. I could have about twenty times over. Bloor shook his head. He said, I don't know, and that's a fact. You must have had some reason. Vera had taken no part in the discussion. She stirred now and said, I think you're both behaving like a pair of idiots. Lombard looked at her. What's this? Vera said, You've forgotten the nursery rhyme. Don't you see there's a clue there? She recited in a meaning voice, Four little Indian boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. She went on, A red herring, that's the vital clue. Armstrong's not dead. He took away the China Indian to make you think he was. You may say what you like, Armstrong's on the island still. His disappearance is just a red herring across the track. Lombard sat down again. He said, You know, you may be right. Bloor said, Yes, but if so, where is he? We've searched the place, outside and inside. Vera said scornfully, We all searched for the revolver, didn't we, and couldn't find it, but it was somewhere all the time. Lombard murmured, There's a slight difference in size, my dear, between a man and a revolver. Vera said, I don't care. I'm sure I'm right. Bloor murmured, Rather giving himself away, wasn't it? Actually mentioning a red herring in the verse. He could have written it up a bit different. Vera cried, But don't you see? He's mad. It's all mad. The whole thing of going by the rhyme is mad. Dressing up the judge, killing Rogers when he was chopping sticks, drugging Mrs. Rogers so that she overslept herself, arranging for a bumblebee when Miss Brent died. It's like some horrible child playing a game. It's all got to fit in. Law said, Yes, you're right, he thought for a minute. At any rate, there's no zoo on the island. You'll have a bit of trouble getting over that. Vera cried, Don't you see? We're the zoo. Last night, we were hardly human any more. We're the zoo. They spent the morning on the cliffs, taking it in turns to flash a mirror at the mainland. There were no signs that anyone saw them, no answering signals. The day was fine, with a slight haze. Below, the sea heaved in a gigantic swell. There were no boats out. They had made another abortive search of the island. There was no trace of the missing physician. Vera looked up at the house from where they were standing. She said, her breath coming with a slight catch in it, One feels safer here out in the open. Don't let's go back into the house again, Lombard said. Not a bad idea. We're pretty safe here. No one can get at us without our seeing him a long time beforehand. Vera said, We'll stay here. Bloor said, We'll have to pass the night somewhere. We'll have to go back to the house then. Vera shuddered. I can't bear it. I can't go through another night, Philip said. You'll be safe enough, locked in your room. Vera murmured. I suppose so. She stretched out her hands, murmuring, Oh, it's lovely. To feel the sun again. She thought, How odd. I'm almost happy. And yet I suppose I'm actually in danger. Somehow, now, nothing seems to matter. Not in daylight. I feel full of power. I feel that I can't die. Bloor was looking at his wristwatch. He said, It's two o'clock. What about lunch? Vera said obstinately. I'm not going back to the house. I'm going to stay here, in the open. Oh, come on now, Miss Claythorne. Got to keep your strength up, you know. Vera said, 
If I even see a tinned tongue, I shall be sick. I don't want any food. People go days on end with nothing sometimes when they're on a diet. Law said, Well, I need my meals regular. What about you, Mr. Lombard? Philip said, You know, I don't relish the idea of tinned tongue particularly. I'll stay here with Miss Claythorne. Law hesitated. Vera said, I shall be quite all right. I don't think he'll shoot me as soon as your back is turned, if that's what you're afraid of. Law said, It's all right if you say so, but we agreed we ought not to separate. Philip said, Well, you're the one who wants to go into the lion's den. I'll come with you, if you like. Oh, no, you won't, said Law. You'll stay here. Philip laughed. <laughs> so you're still afraid of me. Why, I could shoot you both this very minute, if I liked. Law said, Yes, but that wouldn't be according to plan. It's one at a time, and it's got to be done in a certain way. Well, said Philip, you seem to know all about it. Of course, said Bloor, it's a bit jumpy going up to the house alone. Philip said softly, And therefore will I lend you my revolver? Answer, no, I will not. Not quite as simple as that, thank you. Bloor shrugged his shoulders and began to make his way up the steep slope to the house. Lombard said softly, Feeding time at the zoo. The animals are very regular in their habits. Vera said anxiously, Isn't it very risky, what he's doing? In a sense, you mean... No, I don't think it is. Armstrong's not armed, you know. And anyway, Bloor is twice a match for him in physique, and he's very much on his guard. Anyway... It's a sheer impossibility that Armstrong can be in the house. I know he's not there. But what other solution is there? Philip said softly. There's Bloor. Oh, do you really think— Listen, my girl, you heard Bloor's story. You've got to admit that if it's true, I can't possibly have had anything to do with Armstrong's disappearance. His story clears me. But it doesn't clear him. We've only his word for it that he heard footsteps and saw a man going downstairs and out the front door. The whole thing may be a lie. He may have got rid of Armstrong a couple of hours before that. How? Lombard shrugged his shoulders. That we don't know. But if you ask me, we've only one danger to fear, and that danger is Bloor. What do we know about the man? Less than nothing. All this ex-policeman story may be bunkum. He may be anybody. A mad millionaire, crazy businessman, an escaped inmate of Broadmoor. One thing's certain. He could have done every one of these crimes. Vera had gone rather white. She said in a slightly breathless voice, And supposing he gets us? Lombard said softly, patting the revolver in his pocket. I'm going to take very good care he doesn't. Then he looked at her curiously. Touching faith in me, haven't you, Vera? Quite sure I wouldn't shoot you? Vera said, One has got to trust someone. As a matter of fact, I think you're wrong about Bloor. I still think it's Armstrong. She turned to him suddenly. Don't you feel all the time that there's someone? Someone watching and waiting? Lombard said slowly. Well, that's just nerves. Vera said eagerly. Then you have felt it? She shivered. She bent a little closer. Tell me, don't you think— She broke off, and went on. I read a story once about two judges that came to a small American town from the Supreme Court. They administered justice, absolute justice, because they didn't come from this world at all. Lombard raised his eyebrows. He said, Heavenly visitants? No, I don't believe in the supernatural. This business is human enough. Vera said in a low voice, Sometimes I'm not sure. Lombard looked at her. He said, That's conscience. After a moment's silence, he said very quietly, So you did drown that kid after all. Vera said vehemently, I didn't, I didn't, you've no right to say that. He laughed easily. Oh, yes, you did, my good girl. I don't know why. Can't imagine. There was a man in it, probably. Was that it? A sudden feeling of lassitude, 
of intense weariness spread over Vera's limbs. She said in a dull voice, Yes, there was a man in it. Lombard said softly, Thanks. That's what I wanted to know. Vera sat up suddenly. She exclaimed, What was that? It wasn't an earthquake. Lombard said, No. No. Queer, though. A thud shook the ground, and I thought, Did you hear a sort of cry? I did. They stared up at the house. Lombard said, It came from there. We'd better go up and see. No. No, I'm not going. Please yourself. I am. Vera said desperately. All right. I'll come with you. They walked up the slope to the house. The terrace was peaceful and innocuous looking in the sunshine. They hesitated there a minute. Then, instead of entering by the front door, they made a cautious circuit of the house. They found Blore. He was spread-eagled on the stone terrace on the east side, his head crushed and mangled by a great block of white marble. Philip looked up. He said, Whose is that window just above? Vera said in a low, shuddering voice, It's mine, and that's the clock from my mantelpiece. I remember now. It was shaped like a bear. She repeated, and her voice shook and quavered. It was shaped like a bear. Philip grasped her shoulder. He said, and his voice was urgent and grim, That settles it. Armstrong is in hiding somewhere in that house. I'm going to get him. But Vera clung to him. She cried, Don't be a fool. It's us now. We're next. He wants us to look for him. He's counting on it. Philip stopped. He said thoughtfully, There's something in that. Vera cried, At any rate, you do admit now that I was right. He nodded. Yes, you win. It's Armstrong, all right. But where the devil did he hide himself? We went over the place with a fine tooth comb. Vera said urgently, If you didn't find him last night, you won't find him now. That's common sense. Lombard said reluctantly, Yes, but he must have prepared a secret place beforehand. Naturally. Of course. It's just what he would do. You know, like a priest's hole in old manor houses. Oh, this isn't an old house of that kind. Well, he could have had one made. Philip Lombard shook his head. He said, We measured the place. That first morning. I'll swear there's no space unaccounted for. Vera said, There must be. Lombard said, I'd like to see. Vera cried, Yes, you'd like to see. And he knows that. He's in there, waiting for you. Lombard said, half bringing out the revolver from his pocket, I've got this, you know. You said Bloor was all right, that he was more than a match for Armstrong. So he was physically, and he was on the lookout, too. But what you don't seem to realize is that Armstrong is mad, and a madman has all the advantages on his side. He's twice as cunning as anyone sane can be. Lombard put back the revolver in his pocket. He said, Come on, then. Lombard said at last, What are we going to do when night comes? Vera didn't answer. He went on accusingly, oh, You haven't thought of that. She said helplessly, What can we do? Oh, my God, I'm frightened. Philip Lombard said thoughtfully, Well, it's fine weather. There will be a moon. We must find a place. Up by the top cliffs, perhaps. We can sit there and wait for morning. We mustn't go to sleep. We must watch the whole time, and if anyone comes up towards us, I shall shoot. He paused. You'll be cold, perhaps, in that thin dress? Vera said with a raucous laugh, Cold? <laughs> I should be colder if I were dead. Philip Lombard said quietly, Yes, that's true. Vera moved restlessly. She said, I shall go mad if I sit here any longer. Let's move about. All right. They paced slowly up and down, along the line of the rocks overlooking the sea. The sun was dropping towards the west. The light was golden and mellow. It enveloped them in a golden glow. Vera said, with a sudden, nervous little giggle, Pity we can't have a bathe. Philip was looking down towards the sea. He said abruptly, What's that? There. 
You see? By that big rock. No, no, a little further to the right. Vera stared. She said, well, It looks like somebody's clothes. A bather, eh? Lombard laughed. Queer. I suppose it's only seaweed. Vera said, Let's go and look. It is clothes, said Lombard as they drew nearer. A bundle of them. That's a boot. Come on. Let's scramble along there. They scrambled over the rocks. Vera stopped suddenly. She said, It's not clothes. It's a man. The man was wedged between two rocks, flung there by the tide earlier in the day. Lombard and Vera reached it in a last scramble. They bent down. A purple, discoloured face. A hideous, drowned face. Lombard said, My God! It's Armstrong. Chapter 16 Eons passed. World span and world. Time was motionless. It stood still. It passed through a thousand ages. No. It was only a minute or so. Two people were standing looking down on a dead man. Slowly, very slowly, Vera Claythorn and Philip Lombard lifted their heads and looked into each other's eyes. Lombard laughed. He said, <laughs> So that's it, is it, Vera? Vera said, There's no one on the island. No one at all. Except us two. Her voice was a whisper, nothing more. Lombard said, Precisely. So we know where we are, don't we? Vera said, how has it worked? That trick with the marble bear. He shrugged his shoulders. A conjuring trick, my dear. A very good one. Their eyes met again. Vera thought, Why did I never see his face properly before? A wolf, that's what it is, a wolf's face. Those horrible teeth. Lombard said, and his voice was a snarl, dangerous, menacing. This is the end, you understand. We've come to the truth now, and it's the end. Vera said quietly, I understand. She stared out to sea. General MacArthur had stared out to sea. When? Only yesterday, or was it the day before? He too had said, This is the end. He had said it with acceptance, almost with welcome. But to Vera, the words, the thought, brought rebellion. No, it should not be the end. She looked down at the dead man. She said, Poor Dr. Armstrong. Lombard sneered. He said, What's this? Womanly pity? Vera said, Why not? Haven't you any pity? He said, I've no pity for you. Don't expect it. Vera looked down again at the body. She said, We must move him. Carry him up to the house. To join the other victims, I suppose. All neat and tidy. As far as I'm concerned, he can stay where he is. Vera said, At any rate, let's get him out of reach of the sea. Lombard laughed. He said, <laughs> If you like. He bent, tugging at the body. Vera leaned against him, helping him. She pulled and tugged with all her might. Lombard panted. <sighs> Not such an easy job. They managed it, however, drawing the body clear of the high water mark. Lombard said as he straightened up, Satisfied? Vera said, Quite. Her tone warned him. He spun around. Even as he clapped his hand to his pocket, he knew that he would find it empty. She had moved a yard or two and was facing him, revolver in hand. Lombard said, So, that's the reason for your womanly solicitude. You wanted to pick my pocket. She nodded. She held it steadily and unwaveringly. Death was very near to Philip Lombard now. It had never, he knew, been nearer. Nevertheless, he was not beaten yet. He said authoritatively, Give that revolver to me. Vera laughed. Lombard said, Come on, hand it over. His quick brain was working. Which way? Which method? Talk it over? 
lull her into security or a swift dash. All his life, Lombard had taken the risky way. He took it now. He spoke slowly, argumentatively. Now look here, my girl. You just listen, and then he sprang, quick as a panther, as any other feline creature. Automatically, Vera pressed the trigger. Lombard's leaping body stayed poised in mid-spring, then crashed heavily to the ground. Vera came warily forward, the revolver ready in her hand. But there was no need of caution. Philip Lombard was dead, shot through the heart. Relief possessed Vera, enormous, exquisite relief. At last it was over. There was no more fear, no more stealing of her nerves. She was alone on the island. Alone with nine dead bodies, but what did that matter? She was alive. She sat there, exquisitely happy, exquisitely at peace. No more fear. The sun was setting when Vera moved at last. Sheer reaction had kept her immobile. There had been no room in her for anything but the glorious sense of safety. She realized now that she was hungry and sleepy, principally sleepy. She wanted to throw herself on her bed and sleep and sleep and sleep. Tomorrow, perhaps, they would come and rescue her. But she didn't really mind. She didn't mind staying here. Not now that she was alone. Oh, blessed, blessed peace. She got to her feet and glanced up at the house. Nothing to be afraid of any longer. No terrors waiting for her. Just an ordinary, well-built, modern house. And yet a little earlier in the day she had not been able to look at it without shivering. Fear. What a strange thing fear was. Well, it was over now. She had conquered, had triumphed over the most deadly peril. By her own quick-wittedness and adroitness she had turned the tables on her would-be destroyer. She began to walk up towards the house. The sun was setting. The sky to the west was streaked with red and orange. It was beautiful and peaceful. Vera thought, the whole thing might be a dream. How tired she was. Terribly tired. Her limbs ached. Her eyelids were drooping. Not to be afraid any more. To sleep. 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 To sleep safely, since she was alone on the island, one little Indian boy, left all alone. She smiled to herself. She went in at the front door. The house, too, felt strangely peaceful. Vera thought, ordinarily, one wouldn't care to sleep where there's a dead body in practically every bedroom. Should she go to the kitchen and get herself something to eat? She hesitated a moment, then decided against it. She was really too tired. She paused by the dining room door. There were still three little china figures in the middle of the table. Vera laughed. She said, You're behind the times, my dears. She picked up two of them and tossed them out through the window. She heard them crash on the stone of the terrace. The third little figure she picked up and held in her hand. She said, You can come with me. We've won, my dear. We've won. The hall was dim in the dying light. Vera, the little Indian clasped in her hand, began to mount the stairs slowly, because her legs were suddenly very tired. One little Indian boy left all alone. How did it end? Oh, yes. He got married, and then there were none. Married. Funny how she suddenly got the feeling again that Hugo was in the house. Very strong. Yes. Hugo was upstairs, waiting for her. Vera said to herself, Don't be a fool. You're so tired that you're imagining the most fantastic things. Slowly up the stairs. 
At the top of them, something fell from her hand, making hardly any noise on the soft pile carpet. She did not notice that she had dropped the revolver. She was only conscious of clasping a little china figure. How very quiet the house was, and yet it didn't seem like an empty house. Hugo, upstairs waiting for her. One little Indian boy left all alone. What was the last line again? Something about being married? Or was it something else? She had come now to the door of her room. Hugo was waiting for her inside. She was quite sure of it. She opened the door. She gave a gasp. What was that? Hanging from the hook in the ceiling? A rope? With a noose already? And a chair to stand upon? A chair that could be kicked away? That was what Hugo wanted. And, of course, that was the last line of the rhyme. He went and hanged himself, and then there were none. The little china figure fell from her hand. It rolled unheeded and broke against the fender. Like an automaton, Vera moved forward. This was the end. Here, where the cold, wet hand, Cyril's hand, of course, had touched her throat. You can go to the rock, Cyril. That was what murder was. As easy as that. But afterwards, you went on remembering. She climbed up on the chair, her eyes staring in front of her like a sleepwalker's. She adjusted the noose round her neck. Hugo was there to see she did what she had to do. She kicked away the chair. Epilogue Sir Thomas Legg, Assistant Commissioner at Scotland Yard, said irritably, But the whole thing's incredible. Inspector Maine said respectfully, I know, sir. The A.C. went on, Ten people dead, on an island, and not a living soul on it. It doesn't make sense. Inspector Maine said stolidly, Nevertheless, it happened, sir. Sir Thomas Legg said, Damn it all, Maine! Somebody must have killed him. Well, that's just our problem, sir. Nothing helpful in the doctor's report? Oh, no, sir. Wargrave and Lombard were shot, the first through the head, and the second through the heart. Miss Brenton Marston died of cyanide poisoning. Mrs. Rogers died of an overdose of chloral. Rogers' head was split open. Bloor's head was crushed in. Armstrong died of drowning. MacArthur's skull was fractured by a blow on the back of the head, and Vera Claythorne was hanged. The A.C. winced. He said, Nasty business, all of it. He considered for a minute or two. He said irritably, Do you mean to say that you haven't been able to get anything helpful out of the Sticklehaven people? Dash it, they must know something. Inspector Maine shrugged his shoulders. Why, well, they're ordinary, decent, seafaring folk. They know that the island was bought by a man called Owen, and that's about all they do know. Well, who provisioned the island and made all the necessary arrangements? A man called Morris, Isaac Morris. And what does he say about it all? Well, he can't say anything, sir. He's dead. The A.C. frowned. Do we know anything about this, Morris? Oh, yes, sir. We know about him. He wasn't a very savoury gentleman, Mr. Morris. He was implicated in that share-pushing fraud of Benito's three years ago. We're sure of that, though we can't prove it. And he was mixed up in the dope business. And again, we can't prove it. He was a very careful man, Morris. And he was behind this island business? Well, yes, sir. He put through the sale, though he made it clear that he was buying Indian Island for a third party, unnamed. Oh, surely there's something to be found out on the financial angle there. Inspector Maine smiled. Not if you knew Morris. He can wangle figures until the best chartered accountant in the country wouldn't know if he was on his head or his heels. We've had a taste of that in the Benito business. No. He covered his employer's tracks all right. The other man sighed. Inspector Maine went on. It was Morris who made all the arrangements down at Sticklehaven. Represented himself as acting for Mr. Owen. 
and it was he who explained to the people down there that there was some experiment on, some bet about living on a desert island for a week, and that no notice was to be taken of any appeal for help from out there. Sir Thomas Legg stirred uneasily. He said, And you're telling me that those people didn't smell a rat? Not even then? Maine shrugged his shoulders. He said, You're forgetting, sir, that Indian Island previously belonged to young Elmer Robson, the American. He had the most extraordinary parties down there. I've no doubt the local people's eyes fairly popped out over them. But they got used to it, and they'd begun to feel that anything to do with Indian Island would necessarily be incredible. It's natural, that, sir, when you come to think of it. The assistant commissioner admitted gloomily that he supposed it was. Maine said, Fred Narricott, uh, that's the man who took the party out there, did say one thing that was illuminating. He said he was surprised to see what sort of people these were. Not at all like Mr. Robson's parties. I think it was the fact that they were all so normal and so quiet that made him override Morris's orders and take out a boat to the island after he'd heard about the SOS signals. When did he and the other men go? The signals were seen by a party of boy scouts on the morning of the 11th. There was no possibility of getting out there that day. The men got there on the afternoon of the 12th, at the first moment possible to run a boat ashore there. They're all quite positive that nobody could have left the island before they got there. There was a big sea on after the storm. Well, couldn't someone have swum ashore? Well, it's over a mile to the coast, and there were heavy seas and big breakers inshore. And there were a lot of people, boy scouts and others, on the cliffs, looking out towards the island and watching. The A.C. sighed. He said, What about the gramophone record you found in the house? Couldn't you get hold of anything there that might help? Inspector Maine said, I've been into that. It was supplied by a firm that do a lot of theatrical stuff and film effects. It was sent to U.N. Owen, Esquire, care of Isaac Morris, and was understood to be required for the amateur performance of a hitherto unacted play. The typescript of it was returned with the record. Legg said, And what about the subject matter, eh? Inspector Maine said gravely, I'm coming to that, sir. He cleared his throat. I've investigated those accusations as thoroughly as I can. Starting with the Rogerses, who were the first to arrive on the island, they were in service with a Miss Brady, who died suddenly. Can't get anything definite out of the doctor who attended her. He says they certainly didn't poison her, or anything like that. But his personal belief is that there was some funny business that she died as a result of neglect on their part. Says it's the sort of thing that's quite impossible to prove. Then there is uh, Mr. Justice Wargrave. Well, that's okay. He was the judge who sentenced Seaton. By the way, uh, Seaton was guilty. Unmistakably guilty. Evidence turned up later, after he was hanged, which proved that beyond any shadow of doubt. But there was a good deal of comment at the time. Nine people out of ten thought Seaton was innocent, and that the judge's summing up had been vindictive. The Claythorne girl, I find, was governess in a family where a death occurred by drowning. However, she doesn't seem to have had anything to do with it, and as a matter of fact she behaved very well, swam out to the rescue, and was actually carried out to sea and only just rescued in time. Go on, said the A.C. with a sigh. Maine took a deep breath. Dr. Armstrong, now, well-known man, had a consulting room in Harley Street, absolutely straight and above board in his profession, hadn't been able to trace any record of an illegal operation or anything of that kind. It's true, there was a woman called Cleese who was operated on by him way back in 1925 at Leithmore, when he was attached to the hospital there, peritonitis, and she died on the operating table. Maybe he wasn't very skilful over the op. After all, he hadn't much experience. But after all, clumsiness isn't a criminal offence. There was certainly no motive. Then there's Miss Emily Brent. Girl, Beatrice Taylor, was in service with her. Got pregnant, was turned out by her mistress, and went and drowned herself. Not a nice business. But again, not criminal. That, said the A.C., seems to be the point. U.N. Owen dealt with cases that the law couldn't touch. 
Maine went stolidly on with his list. A young Marston was a fairly reckless car driver, had his license endorsed twice, and he ought to have been prohibited from driving, in my opinion. And that's all there is to him. The two names, John and Lucy Coombs, were those of two kids he knocked down and killed near Cambridge. Some friends of his gave evidence for him, and he was let off with a fine. Can't find anything definite about General MacArthur. Fine record, war service, all the rest of it. Arthur Richmond was serving under him in France, and was killed in action. No friction of any kind between him and the General. They were close friends, as a matter of fact. There were some blunders made about that time. Commanding officers sacrificed men unnecessarily. Possibly this was a blunder of that kind. Possibly, said the A.C. Now, Philip Lombard. Lombard has been mixed up in some very curious shows abroad. He sailed very near the law once or twice. Got a reputation for daring, and for not being over-scrupulous. Sort of fellow who might do several murders in some quiet out-of-the-way spot. Then we come to Bloor, Maine hesitated. He, of course, was one of our lot. The other man stirred. Bloor, said the assistant commissioner forcibly, was a bad hat. You think so, sir? The A.C. said, I always thought so, but he was clever enough to get away with it. It's my opinion that he committed black perjury in the Landor case. I wasn't happy about it at the time. But I couldn't find anything. I put Harris onto it, and he couldn't find anything. But I'm still of the opinion that there was something to find if we'd known how to set about it. The man wasn't straight. There was a pause. Then Sir Thomas Legg said, And Isaac Morris is dead, you say? When did he die? I thought you'd soon come to that, sir. Isaac Morris died on the night of August the 8th. Took an overdose of sleeping stuff. One of the barbiturates, I understand. Uh, there wasn't anything to show whether it was accident or suicide. Legg said slowly, Care to know what I think, Maine? Perhaps I can guess, sir, Legg said heavily. That death of Morris is a damn sight too opportune. Inspector Maine nodded. He said, I thought you'd say that, sir. The assistant commissioner brought down his fist with a bang on the table. He cried out, The whole thing's fantastic! Impossible! Ten people killed on a bare rock of an island, and we don't know who did it, or why, or how! Maine coughed. He said, Well, it's not quite like that, sir. We do know why, more or less. Some fanatic with a bee in his bonnet about justice. He was out to get people who were beyond the reach of the law. He picked ten people. Whether they were really guilty or not doesn't matter. The commissioner stirred. He said sharply, Doesn't it? Well, it seems to me. He stopped. Inspector Maine waited respectfully. With a sigh, Legg shook his head. Carry on, he said. Just for a minute. I felt I'd got somewhere. Got, as it were, the clue to the thing. It's gone now. Go ahead with what you were saying. Maine went on. There were ten people to be executed, let's say. They were executed. U.N. Owen accomplished his task, and somehow or other he spirited himself off that island into thin air. The A.C. said, First-class vanishing trick. But you know, Maine, there must be an explanation. Maine said, you're thinking, sir, that if the man wasn't on the island, he couldn't have left the island, and according to the account of the interested parties, he never was on the island. Well, then the only explanation possible is that he was actually one of the ten. The A.C. nodded. Maine said earnestly, We thought of that, sir. We went into it. Now, to begin with, we're not quite in the dark as to what happened on Indian Island. Vera Claythorne kept a diary. So did Emily Brent. Old Wargrave made some notes, dry, legal, cryptic stuff, but quite clear. And Bloor made notes, too. All those accounts tally. The deaths occurred in this order. Marston, Mrs. Rogers, MacArthur, Rogers, 
Miss Brent, Wargrave. After his death, Vera Claythorne's diary states that Armstrong left the house in the night and that Bloor and Lombard had gone after him. Bloor has one more entry in his notebook. Just two words. Armstrong disappeared. Now, sir, it seemed to me, taking everything into account, that we might find here a perfectly good solution. Armstrong was drowned, you remember. Granting that Armstrong was mad, what was to prevent him having killed off all the others and then committed suicide by throwing himself over the cliff, or perhaps while trying to swim to the mainland? That was a good solution. But it won't do. No, sir, it won't do. First of all, there's the police surgeon's evidence. He got to the island early on the morning of August the 13th. He couldn't say much to help us. All he could say was that all the people had been dead at least thirty-six hours, and probably a good deal longer. But he was fairly definite about Armstrong. Said he must have been from eight to ten hours in the water before his body was washed up. That works out of this, that Armstrong must have gone into the sea sometime during the night of the 10th, 11th, and I'll explain why. We found the point where the body was washed up. It had been wedged between two rocks, and there were bits of cloth, hair, etc., on them. It must have been deposited there at high water on the 11th. That's to say around 11 o'clock a.m. After that, the storm subsided, and succeeding high water marks are considerably lower. You might say, I suppose, that Armstrong managed to polish off the other three before he went into the sea that night. But there's another point, and one you can't get over. Armstrong's body had been dragged above high water mark. We found it well above the reach of any tide, and it was laid out straight on the ground, all neat and tidy. So that settles one point definitely. Someone was alive on the island after Armstrong was dead. He paused and then went on. And that leaves just what exactly? Here's the position early on the morning of the 11th. Armstrong has disappeared, drowned. That leaves us three people, Lombard, Bloor, and Vera Claythorne. Lombard was shot. His body was down by the sea near Armstrong's. Vera Claythorne was found hanged in her own bedroom. Bloor's body was on the terrace. His head was crushed in by a heavy marble clock that it seems reasonable to suppose fell on him from the window above. The A.C. said sharply, Well, whose window? Vera Claythorne's. Now, sir, let's take each of these cases separately. First, Philip Lombard. Let's say he pushed over that lump of marble onto Bloor. Then he doped Vera Claythorne and strung her up. Lastly, he went down to the seashore and shot himself. But if so, who took away the revolver from him? For that revolver was found up in the house, just inside the door at the top of the stairs, Wargrave's room. The A.C. said, Any fingerprints on it? Yes, sir, Vera Claythorne's. But, man alive, then I know what you're going to say, sir, that it was Vera Claythorne that she shot Lombard, took the revolver back to the house, toppled the marble block onto Bloor, and then hanged herself. And that's quite all right, up to a point. There's a chair in her bedroom, and on the seat of it there are marks of seaweed, same as on her shoes. Looks as though she stood on the chair, adjusted the rope round her neck, and kicked away the chair. But that chair wasn't found kicked over. It was, like all the other chairs, neatly put back against the wall. That was done after Vera Claythorne's death, by someone else. That leaves us with Bloor. And if you tell me that after shooting Lombard and inducing Vera Claythorne to hang herself, he then went out and pulled down a whacking great block of marble on himself by tying a string to it or something like that, well, I simply don't believe you. Men don't commit suicide that way. And what's more, Bloor wasn't that kind of man. We knew Bloor and he was not the man you'd ever accuse of a desire for abstract justice. The assistant commissioner said, I agree. Inspector Mayne said, And therefore, sir, there must have been someone else on the island, someone who tidied up when the whole business was over. But where was he all the time, and where did he go to? 
The Sticklehaven people are absolutely certain that no one could have left the island before the rescue boat got there. But in that case... He stopped. The assistant commissioner said, In that case... He sighed. He shook his head. He leaned forward. But in that case, he said, who killed them? A manuscript document sent to Scotland Yard by the master of the Emma Jane, fishing trawler. It read as follows. From my earliest youth, I realized that my nature was a mass of contradictions. I have, to begin with, an incurably romantic imagination. The practice of throwing a bottle into the sea with an important document inside was one that never failed to thrill me when reading adventure stories as a child. It thrills me still. And for that reason, I have adopted this course. Writing my confession, enclosing it in a bottle, sealing the latter, and casting it into the waves. There is, I suppose, a hundred to one chance that my confession may be found. And then, or do I flatter myself, a hitherto unsolved murder mystery will be explained. I was born with other traits besides my romantic fancy. I have a definite sadistic delight in seeing or causing death. I remember experiments with wasps, with various garden pests. From an early age, I knew very strongly the lust to kill. But side by side with this went a contradictory trait, a strong sense of justice. It is abhorrent to me that an innocent person or creature should suffer or die by any act of mine. I have always felt strongly that right should prevail. It may be understood, I think a psychologist would understand, that with my mental makeup, being what it was, I adopted the law as a profession. The legal profession satisfied nearly all my instincts. Crime and its punishment has always fascinated me. I enjoy reading every kind of detective story and thriller. I have devised for my own private amusement the most ingenious ways of carrying out a murder. When in due course I came to preside over a court of law, that other secret instinct of mine was encouraged to develop. To see a wretched criminal squirming in the dark, suffering the tortures of the damned as his doom came slowly and slowly nearer, was to me an exquisite pleasure. Mind you, I took no pleasure in seeing an innocent man there. On at least two occasions, I stopped cases where, to my mind, the accused was palpably innocent, directing the jury that there was no case. Thanks, however, to the fairness and efficiency of our police force, the majority of the accused persons who have come before me to be tried for murder have been guilty. I will say here that such was the case with the man Edward Seaton. His appearance and manner were misleading, and he created a good impression on the jury. But not only the evidence, which was clear, though unspectacular, but my own knowledge of criminals told me without any doubt that the man had actually committed the crime with which he was charged, the brutal murder of an elderly woman who trusted him. I have a reputation as a hanging judge, but that is unfair. I have always been strictly just and scrupulous in my summing up of a case. All I have done is to protect the jury against the emotional effect of emotional appeals by some of our more emotional counsel. I have drawn their attention to the actual evidence. For some years past, I have been aware of a change within myself, a lessening of control, a desire to act instead of to judge. I have wanted, let me admit it frankly, to commit a murder myself. I recognized this as the desire of the artist to express himself. I was, or could be, an artist in crime. My imagination, sternly checked by the exigences of my profession, waxed secretly to colossal force. I must, I must, I must commit a murder. And what is more, it must be no ordinary murder. It must be a fantastical crime, something stupendous, out of the common. In that one respect I have still, I think, an adolescent's imagination. I wanted something theatrical, impossible. I wanted to kill. Yes, I wanted to kill. 
but incongruous as it may seem to some, I was restrained and hampered by my innate sense of justice. The innocent must not suffer. And then, quite suddenly, the idea came to me. Started by a chance remark uttered during casual conversation, it was a doctor to whom I was talking, some ordinary undistinguished GP. He mentioned casually how often murder must be committed which the law was unable to touch. And he instanced a particular case, that of an old lady, a patient of his who had recently died. He was, he said, himself convinced that her death was due to the withholding of a restorative drug by a married couple who attended on her and who stood to benefit very substantially by her death. That sort of thing, he explained, was quite impossible to prove, but he was nevertheless quite sure of it in his own mind. He added that there were many cases of a similar nature going on all the time, cases of deliberate murder, and all quite untouchable by the law. That was the beginning of the whole thing. I suddenly saw my way clear, and I determined to commit not one murder, but murder on a grand scale. A childish rhyme of my infancy came back into my mind, the rhyme of the ten little Indian boys. It had fascinated me as a child of two, the inexorable diminishment, the sense of inevitability. I began secretly to collect victims. I will not take up space here by going into detail of how this was accomplished. I had a certain routine line of conversation which I employed with nearly everyone I met, and the results I got were really surprising. During the time I was in a nursing home, I collected the case of Dr. Armstrong, a violently teetotal sister who attended on me, being anxious to prove to me the evils of drink by recounting to me a case many years ago in hospital when a doctor, under the influence of alcohol, had killed a patient on whom he was operating. A careless question as to where the sister in question had trained, etc., soon gave me the necessary data. I tracked down the doctor, and the patient mentioned, without difficulty. A conversation between two old military gossips in my club put me on the track of General MacArthur. A man who had recently returned from the Amazon gave me a devastating resume of the activities of one Philip Lombard. An indignant Memsab in Majorca recounted the tale of the Puritan Emily Brent and her wretched servant girl. Anthony Marston I selected from a large group of people who had committed similar offences. His complete callousness and his inability to feel any responsibility for the lives he had taken made him, I considered, a type dangerous to the community and unfit to live. Ex-Inspector Bloor came my way quite naturally, some of my professional brethren discussing the Landor case with freedom and vigour. I took a serious view of his offence. The police, as servants of the law, must be of a high order of integrity, for their word is perforce believed by virtue of their profession. Finally, there was the case of Vera Claythorn. It was when I was crossing the Atlantic. At a late hour one night the sole occupants of the smoking-room were myself and a good-looking young man called Hugo Hamilton. Hugo Hamilton was unhappy. To assuage that unhappiness he had taken a considerable quantity of drink. He was in the maudlin, confidential stage. Without much hope of any result I automatically started my routine conversational gambit. The response was startling. I can remember his words now. He said, You're right. Murder isn't what most people think. Giving someone a dollop of arsenic, pushing them over a cliff, that sort of stuff. He leaned forward, thrusting his face into mine. He said, I've known a murderess. Known her, I tell you. And what's more, I was crazy about her. God help me, sometimes I think I still am. It's hell, I tell you. Hell! You see, she did it more or less for me. Not that I ever dreamed. Women are fiends, absolute fiends. You wouldn't think a girl like that, a nice, straight, jolly girl, you wouldn't think she'd do that, would you? That she'd take a kid out to sea and let it drown? You wouldn't think a woman could do a thing like that. I said to him, Are you sure she did do it? He said, and in saying it, he seemed suddenly to sober up. I'm quite sure. Nobody else ever thought of it. But I knew the moment I looked at her, when I got back after, and she knew I knew. What she didn't realize was that I loved that kid.
He didn't say any more. But it was easy enough for me to trace back the story and reconstruct it. I needed a tenth victim. I found him in a man named Morris. He was a shady little creature. Amongst other things, he was a dope peddler, and he was responsible for inducing the daughter of friends of mine to take drugs. She committed suicide at the age of twenty-one. During all this time of search, my plan had been gradually maturing in my mind. It was now complete, and the coping stone to it was an interview I had with a doctor in Harley Street. I have mentioned that I underwent an operation. My interview in Harley Street told me that another operation would be useless. My medical adviser wrapped up the information very prettily, but I am accustomed to getting at the truth of a statement. I did not tell the doctor of my decision, that my death should not be a slow and protracted one as it would be in the course of nature. No. My death should take place in a blaze of excitement. I would live before I died. And now to the actual mechanics of the crime of Indian Island. To acquire the island, using the man Morris to cover my tracks, was easy enough. He was an expert in that sort of thing. Tabulating the information I had collected about my prospective victims, I was able to concoct a suitable bait for each. None of my plans miscarried. All my guests arrived at Indian Island on the 8th of August. The party included myself. Morris was already accounted for. He suffered from indigestion. Before leaving London, I gave him a capsule to take last thing at night, which had, I said, done wonders for my own gastric juices. He accepted it unhesitatingly. The man was a slight hypochondriac. I had no fear that he would leave any compromising documents or memoranda behind. He was not that sort of man. The order of death upon the island had been subjected by me to special thought and care. There were, I considered, amongst my guests, varying degrees of guilt. Those whose guilt was the lightest should, I decided, pass out first, and not suffer the prolonged mental strain and fear the more cold-blooded offenders were to suffer. Anthony Marston and Mrs. Rogers died first, the one instantaneously, the other in a peaceful sleep. Marston, I recognized, was a type born without that feeling of moral responsibility which most of us have. He was amoral, pagan. Mrs. Rogers, I had no doubt, had acted very largely under the influence of her husband. I need not describe closely how those two met their deaths. The police would have been able to work that out quite easily. Potassium cyanide is easily obtained by householders for putting down wasps. I had some in my possession, and it was easy to slip it into Marston's almost empty glass during the tense period after the gramophone recital. I may say that I watched the faces of my guests closely during that indictment, and I had no doubt whatever, after my long court experience, that one and all were guilty. During recent bouts of pain, I had been ordered a sleeping draught, chloral hydrate. It had been easy for me to suppress this until I had a lethal amount in my possession. When Rogers brought up some brandy for his wife, he set it down on a table, and in passing that table, I put the stuff into the brandy. It was easy, for at that time suspicion had not begun to set in. General MacArthur met his death quite painlessly. He did not hear me come up behind him. I had, of course, to choose my time for leaving the terrace very carefully, but everything was successful. As I had anticipated, a search was made of the island, and it was discovered that there was no one on it but our seven selves. That at once created an atmosphere of suspicion. According to my plan, I should shortly need an ally. I selected Dr. Armstrong for that part. He was a gullible sort of man. He knew me by sight and reputation, and it was inconceivable to him that a man of my standing should actually be a murderer. All his suspicions were directed against Lombard, and I pretended to concur in these. I hinted to him that I had a scheme by which it might be possible to trap the murderer into incriminating himself. Though a search had been made of everyone's room, no search had as yet been made of the persons themselves but that was bound to come soon. I killed Rogers on the morning of August the 10th. 
He was chopping sticks for lighting the fire and did not hear me approach. I found the key to the dining room door in his pocket. He had locked it the night before. In the confusion attending the finding of Roger's body, I slipped into Lombard's room and abstracted his revolver. I knew that he would have one with him. In fact, I had instructed Morris to suggest as much when he interviewed him. At breakfast, I slipped my last dose of chloral into Miss Brent's coffee when I was refilling her cup. We left her in the dining room. I slipped in there a little while later. She was nearly unconscious, and it was easy to inject a strong solution of cyanide into her. The bumblebee business was really rather childish, but somehow, you know, it pleased me. I liked adhering as closely as possible to my nursery rhyme. Immediately after this, what I had already foreseen happened. Indeed, I believe I suggested it myself. We all submitted to a rigorous search. I had safely hidden away the revolver, and had no more cyanide or chloral in my possession. It was then that I intimated to Armstrong that we must carry our plan into effect. It was simply this. I must appear to be the next victim. That would perhaps rattle the murderer. At any rate, once I was supposed to be dead, I could move about the house and spy upon the unknown murderer. Armstrong was keen on the idea. We carried it out that evening. A little plaster of red mud on the forehead, the red curtain and the wool and the stage was set. The lights of the candles were very flickering and uncertain, and the only person who would examine me closely was Armstrong. It worked perfectly. Miss Claythorne screamed the house down when she found the seaweed, which I had thoughtfully arranged in her room. They all rushed up, and I took up my pose of a murdered man. The effect on them when they found me was all that could be desired. Armstrong acted his part in the most professional manner. They carried me upstairs and laid me on my bed. Nobody worried about me. They were all too deadly scared and terrified of each other. I had a rendezvous with Armstrong outside the house at a quarter to two. I took him up a little way behind the house, on the edge of the cliff. I said that here we could see if anyone else approached us, and we should not be seen from the house as the bedrooms faced the other way. He was still quite unsuspicious, and yet he ought to have been warned. If he had only remembered the words of the nursery rhyme, a red herring swallowed one. He took the red herring all right. It was quite easy. I uttered an exclamation, leant over the cliff, told him to look. Wasn't that the mouth of a cave? He leant right over. A quick, vigorous push sent him off his balance and splash into the heaving sea below. I returned to the house. It must have been my footfall that Bloor heard. A few minutes after I had returned to Armstrong's room, I left it, this time making a certain amount of noise so that someone should hear me. I heard a door open as I got to the bottom of the stairs. They must have just glimpsed my figure as I went out of the front door. It was a minute or two before they followed me. I had gone straight round the house and in at the dining room window, which I had left open. I shut the window, and later I broke the glass. Then I went upstairs and laid myself out again on my bed. I calculated that they would search the house again, but I did not think they would look closely at any of the corpses. A mere twitch aside of the sheet to satisfy themselves that it was not Armstrong masquerading as a body. This is exactly what occurred. I forgot to say that I returned the revolver to Lombard's room. It may be of interest to someone to know where it was hidden during the search. There was a big pile of tinned food in the larder. I opened the bottommost of the tins, biscuits I think it contained, bedded in the revolver, and replaced the strip of adhesive tape. I calculated, and rightly, that no one would think of working their way through a pile of apparently untouched foodstuffs, especially as all the top tins were soldered. The red curtain I had concealed by laying it flat on the seat of one of the drawing-room chairs under the chintz cover and the wool in the seat cushion, cutting a small hole. And now came the moment that I had anticipated. Three people, who were so frightened of each other that anything might happen— and one of them had a revolver. I watched them from the windows of the house. When Bloor came up alone, I had the big marble clock poised ready. Exit Bloor. From my window, 
I saw Vera Claythorne shoot Lombard. A daring and resourceful young woman. I always thought she was a match for him and more. As soon as that had happened, I set the stage in her bedroom. It was an interesting psychological experiment. Would the consciousness of her own guilt, the state of nervous tension consequent on having just shot a man, be sufficient, together with the hypnotic suggestion of her surroundings, to cause her to take her own life? I thought it would. I was right. Vera Claythorne hanged herself before my eyes, where I stood in the shadow of the wardrobe. And now for the last stage. I came forward, picked up the chair, and set it against the wall. I looked for the revolver, and found it at the top of the stairs, where the girl had dropped it. I was careful to preserve her fingerprints on it. And now? I shall finish writing this. I shall enclose it and seal it in a bottle, and I shall throw the bottle into the sea. Why? Yes. Why? It was my ambition to invent a murder mystery that no one could solve. But no artist, I now realize, can be satisfied with art alone. There is a natural craving for recognition which cannot be gainsaid. I have, let me confess it in all humility, a pitiful human wish that someone should know just how clever I have been. In all this, I have assumed that the mystery of Indian Island will remain unsolved. It may be, of course, that the police will be cleverer than I think. There are, after all, three clues. One, the police are perfectly aware that Edward Seaton was guilty. They know, therefore, that one of the ten people on the island was not a murderer in any sense of the word, and it follows, paradoxically, that that person must logically be the murderer. The second clue lies in the seventh verse of the nursery rhyme. Armstrong's death is associated with a red herring, which he swallowed, or rather, which resulted in swallowing him. That is to say, that at that stage of the affair some hocus-pocus is clearly indicated, and that Armstrong was deceived by it and sent to his death. That might start a promising line of inquiry, for at that period there are only four persons, and of those four I am clearly the only one likely to inspire him with confidence. The third is symbolical. The manner of my death, marking me on the forehead, the brand of Cain. There is, I think, little more to say. After entrusting my bottle and its message to the sea, I shall go to my room and lay myself down on the bed. To my eyeglasses is attached what seems a length of fine black cord, but it is elastic cord. I shall lay the weight of the body on the glasses. The cord I shall loop around the door handle and attach it, not too solidly, to the revolver. What I think will happen is this. My hand protected with a handkerchief, will press the trigger. My hand will fall to my side. The revolver, pulled by the elastic, will recoil to the door. Jarred by the door handle, it will detach itself from the elastic and fall. The elastic, released, will hang down innocently from the eyeglasses on which my body is lying. A handkerchief lying on the floor will cause no comment whatever. I shall be found laid neatly on my bed, shot through the forehead in accordance with the record kept by my fellow victims. Times of death cannot be stated with any accuracy by the time our bodies are examined. When the sea goes down, there will come from the mainland boats and men, and they will find ten dead bodies and an unsolved problem on Indian Island. Signed, Lawrence Wargrave.